social workers. I think the reports were great and were very trustworthy and honest. And I have a lot of respect for Jerry. And uh, if you, there's a book that he and Melinda have written if you haven't looked at, A Culture of Fear. It's really good. It kind of talks about DCFS and a lot of the things that they do say that aren't true. So anyway, <laughs> you might want to read that up sometime. Anyway, Jerry, um, your friend, Dennis was going to see her introduce you, but you ready to go? Thank you. If you happen to have a cell phone, anything that makes sound, if you can put it on silent or stun, something that doesn't make a lot of noise, I'd appreciate it. I wanted to first thank Bob for inviting me here to talk to you about the topic that I care deeply about. Um, I've been doing trainings for the last six years, and this particular training and curriculum is near and dear. I've seen a lot of colleagues struggle, crash, and burn because of something that we don't talk about. We don't have a coherent narrative when it comes to self-care. We just kind of sink or swim, right? Although we know we're feeling an impact with the work that we do. We're learning more and more that the, the typical, the stereotypical trauma workers that we have in our community are actually much greater than we realized. That a lot of us are doing trauma work and we don't even realize it. There's a handout that hopefully most of you got when you walked in. If you turn that handout to the first page, before we get into the meat and potatoes of this introduction, and this is an introduction. I only have about 60 minutes with you. Uh, hopefully I'll have another opportunity to talk to you and share more information. But this normally is a day or, or a day and a half training. But I want to give you the meat and potatoes to begin the discussion. So in that first page as you look at it, you'll see that one of the most important points that I want to discuss first is the whole notion of who is a trauma worker in our community. Most of us would think about a fireman, an EMT worker, emergency response doctors. But when you think about the real trauma workers, the trauma workers that are working day in and day out, week in, week out, month after month, then you start to realize that a lot of professions that were never, never characterized or targeted as trauma workers actually do tremendous trauma work. You work with and service the population in the important work that you do that is profoundly traumatized. And you sit down with them and you look at them in the eyes and you experience their deep wells of sadness, their fear, their pain, their struggle in dealing with the issues, the serious and complicated issues that you're helping them to work through. And in those moments, they're sharing their trauma experience, their trauma material. You're not only witnessing their trauma experience, but you're having a reaction. It's actually touching you in ways that is very profound. It's very personal. But because we don't recognize ourselves as trauma workers, we simply set aside that, that interaction, that moment. And after a while, when we've had that interaction or that moment, 20 times, 30 times, 50 times, and we haven't done anything with that experience personally, we see that things start to change for us. That, that reaction is starting to shift how we kind of feel and see things. Vicarious traumatization is a topic we're going to discuss today. It's the construct. It's the language we're going to use to try to help them to understand that personal impact that has a profound and pervasive impact, not only professionally, but when we go home at the end of our days and we talk to our spouses, our partners, our intimates, that impact follows us. And we all know it. We all feel it. We've seen our colleagues struggle with very serious issues and try, try to find ways to deal with it. So first of all, it's important to understand that we're part of that trauma worker community because of the very important and very serious work that we do with the population that we service as we experience and witness their trauma that they're struggling with. Now the presentation that you're going to see, you have in the handout, but we're going to kind of jump around a little bit because this is a day-long training. So I'm going to try to give you very, very concrete and specific information to give you enough begin to understand that this is something that we need to talk about and address. If you turn that page, vicarious traumatization. You may have heard terms like compassion fatigue, secondary traumatic stress. Well, vicarious traumatization is a term that we're understanding 
that is well suited for us to understand our impact. Because we have ongoing exposure to a traumatized population. We're going to see an individual once, twice, six times, six times, ten times, maybe over the course of months. So we're going to have a lot of exposure to that traumatized individual and the material that they bring to us in that moment. So it's important to understand that VT is distinguished from those other terms simply by the fact that it's accumulation. It's a cumulative effect. It's the buildup over time, having been exposed to that person or persons over an extended period. So vicarious traumatization is a buildup, an accumulation over time. It's our empathic engagement as we sit there and we go eye to eye and we care and we want to make a difference. And we can feel that impact emotionally, internally, as we're listening, and that build up over time. So it's an accumulation over time. And that's what's tricky about VT. It's insidious in that it is a build up. So you may not recognize it when you first start this work. But after several months, that second year, third year, you'll see that, oh my goodness, something has happened, something is changing in me in doing this work and servicing this population, and I didn't even see it happen. I just start to feel the change, and my intimates are starting to tell me, hey, things seem to be different about you. There's a lot of research that's helping us understand that when we have empathic engagement, that when we care about that person, and that we're empathically open, and we're listening, and we're hearing their traumatic material, that there is an indirect trauma that's taking place with us that we're generating our own emotional material because of that empathic engagement. It's not uncommon to see trauma workers after a while experience post-traumatic stress disorder or symptoms like PTSD, depression or depression-like symptoms, miscarriages, cognitive problems with memory, concentration, problems with trust, there are a lot of serious issues that we're seeing among our helping professionals that we never recognized that had to do directly, specifically, with the work that we're doing and servicing a traumatized population. How it's personally touching us, impacting us. Page 40. Page 4 in your packet. There is a transformation that takes place. There is a change in us that's going to happen. It's not something you can avoid. Because whenever we sit down and we're empathically engaging this population, this traumatized population, things are changing for us. Because we're generating our own emotional material. And we're not doing anything with that. Because our days are busy. We have a lot of cases. We have a lot of reports. We have deadlines. But most importantly, we don't recognize that that impact is something that we need to address. So it simply goes ignored. We don't pay attention to it. We allow that buildup of that empathic engagement and that emotional material to just build and build over time. And then we can see the impact in us. And we can see a lot of the symptoms that I talked about that are just the tip of the iceberg because we're not taking time to recognize that when we sit down with a traumatized population, we're going to have to do something in terms of self-care. Right now, there is no coherent narrative about self-care in our professions. We just kind of treat it as a sidebar. Oh, we're going to get to it when we take that vacation. You know what? In about a year or two, we're going to take a long vacation. We're going to feel great. And that's usually how we address that buildup and what we're feeling and experiencing not recognizing that we're ignoring it along the way and it's actually having a profound impact on us in the way we see ourselves and the way we see our clients and our world view. It has a very pervasive impact. The next page, page nine. Can you, can you slide over sir? They can't see you at the televised portion. Oh, okay. To your left. Okay. We all have core beliefs. We all have beliefs about how we feel about 
those clients we service, other people. We have core beliefs about ourselves. We have core beliefs about our worldview, how we see the world. While we're finding more and more with trauma workers over a time period that our core beliefs that we hold dear and dear that help to define us in terms of our personality, how people see us, starts to change over time when we do this kind of work and we do nothing to address the impact on self. We do nothing to recognize that the impact is taking place and that there's a need to mitigate that impact. We see that there's a shift to our core beliefs and how we see the world and how we feel about other. We sometimes can see it in ourselves, but usually our colleagues see it. We seem more irritable, less patient. We're starting to avoid. We're starting to do things that we typically would assign to our clients and the consumers that we're servicing. It's not unusual for trauma workers, the ones that do not identify themselves as trauma workers, to become connoisseurs of wine. Oh, my, but we don't do that, right? We don't self-medicate. But these are the things that we do to try to address this because we're not understanding what's taking place. We're not understanding in those moments when we sit down with a human being who is scared, sad, distressed, overwhelmed, that there is an impact, that there is a reaction that we're dealing with, and that there's gonna be a buildup of that reaction over time. We've seen it in our colleagues over a time period. We've seen the shifting and changing in their personality and how they view their work and how they view their clients. If you've ever heard clients say, well, boy, they really seem, you know, like they're becoming impatient, irritable, like they don't care, they, they, they get so much more upset, they're very short with me. And we think, well, that person was really different initially. They were really patient initially. They really seemed to be so compassionate. What happened to that individual over a period of time in working with this population and doing this work with a traumatized group of people? What took place between that beginning and where they are now? And why did it take place? VT is a very real phenomenon that we're seeing over and over again with helping professionals that have previously never been recognized as trauma workers. So it's really critically important to identify as a trauma worker to understand that impact. And to be able to focus on what's going on when we are engaging that population with us. I'm gonna show you a video about the mind-body connection it's a doctor that's going to help us understand how VT has a very clear impact in our mind-body connection neurologically. interchangeably 
with the term secondary traumatic stress. Beneficiaries of our work are said to be primarily affected by trauma. Through our work with them, we may experience that traumatic stress secondarily. Healthcare, humanitarian aid, rescue workers, police, religious service organizations, nonprofits that work with people in crisis. These are all vulnerable organizations because in the process of helping people, they have close contact with human misery. Signs of ET can be obvious, such as increased nightmares, or flashbacks, which are waking reminders of one's work. But usually, ET shows up in ways that do not seem connected to service work at all. For example, special helpers may be irritable with their co-workers and their family. They frequently develop sleeping difficulties. Those touched by VT may find it challenging to relax like other people relax. Such neurobiological irritability is called hyperarousal and is related to traumatic work content. Hyperarousal is an adaptation that a traumatized mind and body make in order to stay alert for danger. Further signs of VT include concentration problems or memory gaps. A person may not be able to function 100% due to cognitive difficulties like this. All of us have what is called subcortical activity, which is like computer background programs in the unconscious parts of the mind. We need this activity to survive. But if a person dealing with a lot of trauma does not metabolize that trauma, this subcortical activity consumes more of the brain and takes attention and energy away from day-to-day -day decisions and actions. This may not only lead to doing poor quality work, but it could lead to misjudging situations and making unsafe decisions. So while PT is an occupational hazard, that doesn't mean everyone in this field automatically has a condition or that helpers are fated to be victims of trauma. What it does mean is that when helper organizations absorb a great deal of trauma, the overall cost not addressing BT can be massive because your human assets are compromised. It also means that helper organizations have a special opportunity to maximize the program quality and the worker quality of life by addressing BT. My expertise area as a physician is preventive and behavioral medicine. In this field, our role is to lay out a menu of options that people can choose from. The strategies I offer people help prevent problems before they affect a person's work and life. Furthermore, I believe it is important to adapt strategies that fit the culture of the people with whom I am working. Healthcare providers, humanitarian workers, nonprofit staff, first responders. These groups frequently work with people who are fearful, grieving, anxious, or under siege. I urge all these helper organizations to institute strategies that metabolize VT. I think it is only a matter of time before all organizations see that preventing and mitigating VT is a long term investment in occupational sustainability. We are not going to eliminate PT, and doing self-care and prevention strategies for several hours a day is not an option. With a little organizational support, however, people like myself can show how it is easy to adopt targeted strategies ranging from self-care, leadership interventions, and smart management. We can really do this without resorting to great financial costs. In my experience, in fact, Organizations have either suddenly realized or eventually realized that they cannot afford not to prevent VT. Ultimately, all helpers and caregivers need strategies to metabolize the stress that comes with the territory of what is extremely demanding and rewarding work. I think we can agree that no helper should have to pay an emotional cost to do this work if that cost is preventable. My personal mission, therefore, is to see that people stay as healthy as possible 
while doing this work. 